Okay, so today what we're going to do, we're focusing on, actually for our last couple of classes here before our, our test, our next test is next Wednesday, um, we're going to be focusing on measurement. And dealing with measurement here, we first have to talk about the origins of measurement. And really, measurement came from a need to communicate. And I'm going to start out with length just because that's the easiest one to equate some of this stuff to. But let's say that there are two people that are trying to build something. They're trying to build two things that are exactly alike. Now, if they're in the room with each other, they can just go back and forth and compare and mark things off. Um, you know, if they're down the street or across town or whatever, it's a little more difficult. And I suppose you could always take a stick or something and mark it down and send it or a string and cut it to that length. But it would be really nice if we could write a measurement down and use it to communicate. So that's what they did. And they, they may have taken something like, let's say this piece of paper is what we wanted. And you, I wanted to send you a message so that you knew how big to make yours. So I might take my pen and I might say, okay, this is one, two, about two and a half pens long. Well, if it gets to you and you've got a pen, well, you might go, okay, there's one, Two, well, for you, two and a half pens is about this long. It's much different. You know, the problem there was, you know, here's the pen I used, and here's the pen you had. You can see very, very different in size there. So there's two assumptions that have to be made and have to be not necessarily absolutely true, but close to true for measurement to work. The first is whatever I use to measure that object you must have one of the same thing. The second assumption that has some uh, uh, condition that has to be true is that the item I used is approximately the same size as the one you have. So what they resorted to in many cases was body parts. Like for length, um, our, our smallest unit of length is the inch. That's actually the distance from the end of the thumb to the point of that first knuckle. That is an inch. So we could measure our piece of paper here. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I got ten of my thumb, so my thumb must be slightly larger than an inch because we know it's 11 inches. But pretty much everybody had at least one thumb, and the size from one thumb to the next is relatively consistent. Um, other body parts, of course, were used if we're looking at length. So that's the inch. The next biggest unit when we're talking about length, what is the next biggest unit? Can anybody tell me? The foot. Very good. One foot contains how many inches? Twelve. Twelve. Good. So the foot, of course, is just what you would think. It is from the tip of your, lo your longest toe to the back of your heel. And for most people, if you tried to compare, there would not be 12 of their thumbs in a foot. So obviously, even from one person to the next, there is a slight variation in their thumb and e even a greater variation in their foot. So they weren't terribly precise from one person to the next. It was in the 500s that King Henry actually declared that his thumb and his foot and everything else were going to be the official measurements of the land. And even though that was more of an egotistical move on his part, um, it really did free up measurement for some, some big things. So they came in and they took his thumb and they copied its length. I don't know if they used a block of wood or what. They, most likely wood would have been their easiest medium cut that block of wood the size of his thumb and they passed those out for everybody who uses an inch. They did the same with his foot and everything else. Well, his foot did not have exactly 12 of his, his thumbs, his inches in him. So it was a few hundred years later that they were adjusted so that they could they changed the length of the inch in the foot to make it so there's 12 inches in a foot. Because it was, it was necessary, if, if I measure something in feet, and you measure something in inches, up until that point, there was absolutely no way to tell which one was longer or shorter because there was no translation, no equivalency between them. So by adjusting those lengths to create that equivalency, then they could be compared. 
Now, one of the issues with that was King Henry was not the only one who had that idea. So, of course, his thumb and his foot were only used in his kingdom. Um, other rulers throughout the world had similar ideas. So the official inch and official foot and, and so on throughout the world may have been different from one country to the next. And that was one problem with the standard measuring system. The standard measurement is what's called an evolved system. It developed to fit a need, that need of communication like we said. And from that it evolved. You know, they decided, hey, it would be nice if we could standardize these. So different rulers, you know, declared their, their body parts to be the standards. And then it was, well, hey, it would be nice if we could translate, if we had an equivalency between feet and inches. So the system evolved, they adjusted those sizes to, to make there be an equivalency. Uh, other evolved steps were some units that used to be necessary are no longer necessary. So those units were pushed out of the system and not used anymore. Because of this, there wasn't a lot of real preparation put into it, so the system was very awkward. Um, let's look at some more of our units and I'll explain more as to, to what you mean by that being awkward. Now the part of the consequence of King Henry declaring that his foot was the official foot of the land was there are now units that didn't that weren't needed anymore. Um, for example, if I wanted to measure the height of the wall next to me here, if I were working um, now, I would measure that height in feet. But back then, I would not measure that height in feet because I can't get my foot to the top of that wall. So once King Edward, or it was King Edward, I've been saying King Henry, haven't I? Um, it wasn't King Henry, it's King Edward. Once King Edward declared his foot to be the official measuring unit and they had those blocks of wood, I could now take that block of wood and get up to the top of the wall. I didn't have to try to get my foot all the way up there. So that was one of the consequences of him doing that. Up until that point, there was a unit called a hand that would have been used for measuring that wall. And the hand was just the width of the hand at the base of the fingers right across here. And it was about four inches. Um, anything that was vertical up and down was measured with hands rather than feet. In fact, to this day, livestock, um, cows, horses, and sheep are still measured in hands rather than feet or inches for height. Um, there are several other units that come in there. One is a furlong. The furlong is actually the distance from the tip of your longest finger to the point of your elbow, or furlong, sorry, the cubit, I should say, from the tip of your middle finger to the point of your elbow. Um, that was a construction unit for spacing wall studs and floor joists and stuff. That was about 16 inches, so that's where our 16-inch spacing came from that we use now. Um, the furlong was a racing unit. Um, the origin of that, there's a lot of different rumors out there, and I haven't really found one that I think looks consistent, but it's about an eighth of a mile. Um, the fathom for measuring depth of water is about six feet. That actually came from the, the fathom was the height of the tallest sailor on the boat, which is usually about six feet. So those units became unnecessary as we developed you know, the standardized units. The other thing that, uh, that uh, King Edward's declaration allowed us to do is now that we had that block of wood or whatever material that had an inch, the idea came along, well, let's just take a big stick and set that block on it and mark it out. And then we can number that stick. And rather than having to, to set that block next to things and slide it along, move it along to measure, because every time we move that block, there's a small error introduced. We can just take this stick and compare it. And that was the, the origin of our first rulers came from that. So King Edward, even though, like I said, is a very egotistical move to declare that his body parts were going to be the official measurements of the land, and again, other rulers did the same thing, it really allowed measurement to, to evolve and change and become better. So bigger than a foot, the uh, one we'll use is a yard. A yard is how many feet? Anybody know how many feet are in a yard? Three. Three, good. 
So the yard, a lot of people think a yard is the length of a person's stride. Um, and it is a pro that is approximately three feet. But the yard actually comes from, it's a tailor's unit. It's from the end of your outstretched arm to the center of your chest or the point of your nose. That is a yard. So a yard of fabric, you'd grab the fabric, you'd pull it out as far as you could reach, and at the center of your chest would be the end of the yard, or center point of your nose would be the end of the yard. There is, like we, we mentioned some of the longer ones like fathom and furlough, and there is one in there that we're going to point out. It's called a rod. A rod is 5.5 yards, 5.5 yards, or 16.5 feet. A rod was originally a shepherd's tool. Um, a shepherd had a rod and a staff. The staff was that you know, little hook like you see little Bo Peep carrying. That was for hooking animals around the neck so you could detain them for whatever you needed to do if you needed to treat them for medical care or whatever. Um, the rod was a defensive weapon. It was really literally used to fight off wild animals. And how it became used for measurement is when they started, the land started to get more crowded and flocks started to overlap. There was no good way to mark sheep. Um, cows could be branded. Horses were even branded. Sheep, that didn't work so well because the wool got too thick to see the brand. So they started dividing up the land. So they would take a landmark, like a big tree, and they would, the two shepherds would get together. One would put down their rod. The next one would put their rod down. So that'd be two, three. And they'd use that to measure out the land so that they both had equal allotments of land to pasture their sheep on it to keep them separate. To this day, if you look at land surveys, um, legal descriptions of properties <coughs> and land surveys are usually done in rods still. Bigger than a rod is a mile. Can anybody tell me how many feet are in a mile? Good job, 5,280. How about how many yards are in a mile? This one, a lot of people don't know this one anymore. It is 1,760. The, just like the furlong, there are a lot of uh, rumors out there about where a mile came from. The mile, the, the one that I think is the most credibility came from the Roman military. A mile was a Roman soldiers marching in formation. It was a thousand paces. So a pace was starting on your left foot, going to your right foot and back to your left foot. So a thousand paces in formation was a mile. So those are our units of length. And like we said, that system evolved. All of those, there was never three feet in a yard, or at least most people don't have three of their feet in a yard. So that those lengths were adjusted to make them fit. And the same with the mile and the rod and everything else. So that system had to evolve to work. And we ended up with some very awkward numbers, you know, 12 inches in a foot, three feet in a mile, five and a half yards in a rod, 5,280 feet. I mean, it's just, it's, it's very, very awkward translations in, the, in those measurements, conversions. And we're going to see that in the rest of our standard measurements as well. When the metric system came along, I'm just going to take a very quick mention of the metric system. We'll look at the units in a little bit. The metric system was developed in the 1880s, 1890s. Um, we had literally been using measurements for thousands of years. And we, you know, we had this issue that the measurements just kind of evolved and were forced to go together as a me measuring system. But we, we knew what worked well with what we had and what didn't work well. So they were able to design a system. So whereas the standard system was an evolved system, the metric system was a designed system. And it was designed to work more smoothly than the standard system. So to get rid of all those little bumps that, that were problems with the standard system, but keep all the strengths and build upon those strengths. And we'll look at the metric system in a little bit. So next we want to look at capacity. A lot of people use the term capacity and volume interchangeably. There is a slight difference 
between capacity and volume. Capacity is a standard container. Volume is a length, width, and height. So the difference is volume is what we find when we take an object and we measure lengths on that object and calculate a volume. So volume is always calculated from other dimensions. So if we have you know, length, width, and height, we use those measurements are all lengths really just in different directions we use those measurements to calculate the volume capacity it doesn't matter length dimensions don't matter it's a standard size container our unit that we're going to start out with for capacity is a gallon now the gallon actually was this the size of a man's hat um, now, it was not a cowboy hat, it was like the derby hats and dress hats that were used um, in Europe at that time. Um, you heard the, you've heard the phrase, a 10-gallon hat. Well, that didn't really refer to a ha hat that held actually held 10 gallons. It was just a really big hat. Most of the cowboy or western-style hats were referred to as 10-gallon hats because they were bigger than the standard men's hat. So, smaller than a gallon. Can anybody tell me what the next smaller unit is from a gallon? Starts with a Q. Quart. There we go. How many quarts are in a gallon? There are four. Yeah. The quart actually comes from the word quarter. It was a quarter gallon, so it just came to be known as a quart. So the quart and the gallon are units that were actually part of each other. There was a translation. Smaller than a quart, what is our next unit? Begins with a P. Pint, there we go. Now a pint in itself was its own unit. A pint was a standard size jar or container for um, a pint of of drink of, of beer or whatever was a standard size as well so the size of the pint had to be adjusted to make it fit in with a quart a quart is how many pints there are two pints there we go two pints in a quart smaller than a pint we have what is our next smaller unit a cup, good. How many cups are in a pint? Six. Careful. One. There's two cups in a pint. <laughs> um, a cup was a standard size drinking glass, so a little bit smaller. Um, the cup was actually like a tin cup that was usually attached to a person's pack for drinking water. A little side note here, by the way. The abbreviation of quart is QT and pint is PT. In some type fonts, a Q looks like that and a P looks like that. They're actually mirror images of each other in some fonts. So be very careful. It's really easy if you have any tendencies like I do to, to flip letters. It can be really easy to, to confuse those two. There are units smaller than a cup that we're going to look at. Smaller than a cup, we have the fluid ounce. Does anybody know how many fluid ounces are in a cup? Eight. There we go. Eight fluid ounces in a cup. Smaller than a fluid ounce. We have the tablespoon. Now, most people are more familiar with how many tablespoons are in a cup than they are how many tablespoons are in a fluid ounce. Can anybody tell me either one? The one I was taught and I always remembered was one cup is 16 tablespoons. So one fluid ounce is two tablespoons. 
smaller than the tablespoon. We have the teaspoon. And one tablespoon is three teaspoons. Now I'm going to do a side note here on the tablespoon and teaspoon. Abbreviations. Obviously the tablespoon was the spoon that they used for eating at the table. And the tea was actually used for putting sugar in the tea. Or coffee. Um, tablespoon is abbreviated. It can be TBSP like that. Or it can be a small TBSP. It can be just capital TSP. Or it can be just capital T. All four of those are acceptable abbreviations for tablespoon. Teaspoon is either small TSP or just small T. So you can see there's a lot of room for confusion there. The biggest thing is tablespoon is almost always done with a capital T unless they use the B with it. Teaspoon is always with a small T. So you have to be very, very careful when you're looking at those abbreviations. Now these next couple of units I'm going to use you don't have to write down. I'm throwing them out here just because a lot of people aren't, don't realize that they're actually really units. Um, smaller than a teaspoon, one teaspoon contains two dashes. A dash, if you think of, you know, you're familiar with a, a salt shaker or a pepper shaker. Um, a spice shaker was just a bigger version of one of those. And one dash was literally just one little shake of that, that shaker. That was a dash of spice. Smaller than a dash. One dash contained three pinches. Pinch was literally reaching with your fingers and pinching together. And what was between your fingers was a pinch. And one pinch contains two smidgens. Those are actual real units. A smidgen was just you put one finger into the spice and what stuck to your finger, you put that into the recipe. So a very, very small amount. There are other units that are larger than these. Larger than a gallon. We have a peck. You heard the old tongue twister, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Um, a peck is actually a unit that is two gallons. Uh, if you ever go to a strawberry patch, those uh, little trays that they have that you buy, um, those are usually one pack, two pack, or four pack trays. A bushel is eight gallons. Then, of course, you have a barrel and a drum going up from there. Any questions on those? Okay, I'm thinking I'm catching up on extraneous conversation, but um, were there any questions for me on these? Okay, yeah, that was an outside conversation. Okay, so anyway, the one thing I do want to mention is the cup. The cup, um, you know, we said there was a a small tin cup that was used for that. It actually that also did come. The size of that came from the body as well taking your cupped hand like this and dumping um, sugar or flour into your hand, what you held in your hand was one cup in your cupped hand. Uh, I've, my hands are kind of large, but I have a friend who's a caterer, and I've measured her cup several times, and they're almost exactly dead on. So a cup was originally only used for dry measurement. Um, the pint, of course, is only used for liquid measurement. So each of these... Uh, had their own origins and they were forced to be together. Now all of them are used for both dry or liquid measurement. Obviously the pinches and dashes were only for dry measurement because you couldn't pinch a liquid between your fingers. So that because they've now been standardized and put together, they can apply to both powder or liquid. Now there is an equivalence between these capacities and our volumes. One gallon is approximately 231 cubic inches. Now I use that 
that kind of squiggly equal sign because it's not exact. One gallon is not exactly 231 cubic inches. It's close, but not quite exact. And that's one of the other problems with the standard system is they weren't ever intending to convert between things, so they nothing's really planned out. So they just had to measure it out and see what it said it what see what it came close to, and that's what they have to deal with. So the last one we're going to talk about here, um, we are going to talk about, oh, there is also, by the way, um, when we talk about apothecary units, there are some other units of volume or of capacity that we'll put in here, and we'll be talking about those most likely on Monday. But uh, let's talk now about weight and mass. Like uh, the capacity and volume, there is a slight difference between weight and mass. Weight is a measurement of the force of gravity on an object. Mass is the measurement of the amount of matter, or the amount of material in that object. Now, they might sound like the same thing, and they do kind of, they are very closely related to each other, but the biggest difference is how they're measured. Weight is measured using a scale, and all a scale is is a spring. A spring will stretch a predictable amount for a predictable force put on it. So if we hang the item we're trying to measure on there, or we put an indicator on that spring like this, we can put a scale, the scale is actually the numbering on that, that scale. And as that indicator moves, according to the weight that's put on there, the distance that indicator moves indicates what the force is applied to that spring. Like I said, it, it stretches a predictable amount for a given amount of force. Mass is measured using a balance. What they do for a balance, the way that works is you put the item we're measuring on one side then you put known masses on the other side until it balances. Whatever balances the, the item over here is the mass of that object. Now, on Earth, these things are relatively closely related. Um, if we were to go somewhere else, like say we go to the moon, where gravity is one-sixth of what it is on Earth, well, the scale, since gravity is less, it's going to stretch less. So the weight on the moon is going to be much less. The mass, well, the amount of gravity pulling on the known or the object we're measuring is going to be less, but the amount of gravity pulling on our known mass is also going to be less. So the actual mass of the object doesn't change because we're comparing two items rather than using that, that spring and that known force. So back to, to Earth here for a second. On Earth, gravity is relatively constant. It's actually uh, about a about a two or three percent difference between the equator and the north and south poles. So that means a person who weighs two hundred pounds might be might see five or six pounds difference between the equator and the poles. So very very small, really. So on Earth, we kind of work under the assumption a little bit sloppily that weight and and mass are interchangeable. Now, in our standard system, we tend to focus on weight. There is a unit of mass in the standard system. It is called a slug. You've heard the expression of, oh boy, he, he has a whole slug of those. That's actually where that expression came from, is the, the measurement unit of a slug. One slug actually weighs about 32 pounds. So that's a relatively large unit. Um, also, uh, there's the unit of a stone that was used for mass that comes in there. It doesn't have a real clean translation. A stone is, is uh, depending on where it was standardized, was 17 or 18 pounds. So anyway, back over to weight. We're going to look at the largest unit of weight, one ton. How many pounds are in a ton? 2,000 a pound or a ton. So 2,000 pounds. That's not bad. Now, this is what's called a net or a short ton. 
Um, there is what's called a, a gross or a long ton out there, and it comes from the fact that the ton was originally used for buying and selling grain, and you can't just put a pile of grain on a scale, it'll fall off. So they had containers. So the container that held 2,000 pounds of grain was about 240 pounds. So there's that long ton that's 2,240 pounds. Now I'm not even writing it down because I don't want to confuse you. I mean, 99.999% of the time when you hear the word ton, they are talking about 2,000 pounds. So smaller than a ton, or smaller than a pound, by the way, the abbreviation for pound is LB because, you know, PD would make sense for pound, but in the bookkeeping for buying and selling grain, PD was already used as the abbreviation for paid. So to avoid confusion, they used the Latin word for pound, which is Libra, and so they used LB from that word to abbreviate pound. Smaller than a pound, we have ounces. How many ounces are in a pound? Anybody? Sixteen. Sixteen, good. The ounce is abbreviated OZ. Since they abbreviated the pound off the Latin word for pound, they abbreviated ounce off the Latin word for ounce. And right now I can't remember what that is, but OZ is the abbreviation. Now, a lot of people don't realize that there were units smaller than a pound. There actually is a dram. One ounce contains 16 drams. And smaller than a dram, there is grains. But grains actually went directly from pounds. One pound was 7,000 grains. Uh, if there's any hunting enthusiasts, uh, ammunition, gunpowder, and bullets are measured out in grains. Um, grain was literally taking like a, a grain of salt, a grain of a powder, and counting it out for medication. Now a grain was so, so ingrained, so entrenched in the medical field that a grain has been absorbed into the metric system for medical purposes. So they can measure, you know, medicine still can be measured in grains. And they've got conversions in the metric system. Unfortunately, it's been very sloppy conversions. Okay, so let's take a look now at converting within the standard system. You know, if I have four feet and I want to convert into inches. Now, many of you can just look at that and with some thought say that's 48 inches because you know there's 12 inches in a foot. But if you didn't know that off the top of your head, we would do a conversion. And this conversion is called dimensional analysis. So what we're doing is we're allowing the units to tell us what to do in our calculation. So we make the measurement into a fraction. Four feet becomes four feet over one. And we're going to multiply by a conversion factor. Now this is where the dimensional part of dimensional analysis comes in. I want to get rid of feet. So to make the feet go away, in my fractions, I put feet on bottom here. Now they are diagonal with each other. They will cross cancel out in my calculation. I'm converting into inches, so inches will go there. And my relationship between feet and inches, one foot is 12 inches. So now this tells me four times 12 inches is 48 inches. One times one is one. So that's just 48 inches over one or just 48 inches. If we had um, 336 ounces, and I want to know how many pounds that is, we would do 336 ounces over 1. And then my conversion factor, I always start with what has to go on bottom because what goes down here has to match up with what I'm canceling out here. That's going to be ounces, so that those will cancel out. We're converting into pounds, so it'll be pounds on top. And the relationship is one pound is 16 ounces. So I always fill in the units first and then put in the numbers for the relationship. So the ounces do cancel out. 336 times one pound is 336 pounds. One times 16 is 16. 
and 336 divided by 16 is 21 pounds. So this is 21 pounds here. We could also use a proportion for our conversions. We'd use our relationship. Like here we have one pound equals 16 ounces. And we could actually use that to create a rate. One pound equals 16 ounces. So then over here, we have to match up our units. We have ounces, so they have to stay with ounces. 336 ounces goes there. And you can cross, multiply, and divide. 1 times 336 divided by 16 is still 21 pounds. I show you both methods because when we get to dosage calculations in the next unit, both of those methods are extremely important. Both of those apply to calculating our dosages. Okay, so now the next step, let's look at our metric system. In the metric system, there is only one unit of measure for each type of measurement. For length, that unit is the meter, abbreviated with just an M. For capacity, that unit is the liter, abbreviated with just an L. I was always taught that the liter had to be abbreviated with a capital L. The main reason for that was in the older typewriters, um, a small L and a 1 were indistinguishable. In fact, some of them didn't even have a 1 key. You just used the small L for a 1. So in order to avoid confusion, they used a capital L. Now with modern type fonts, you can tell the difference. So it has become acceptable to use a small L for leader. You're going to still see me use a capital L just out of habit, but it is okay to use a small L now. For mass, they use the gram which is abbreviated with a G. Now you notice I said mass. In the standard system, we tend to focus on weight with the pounds and ounces. In the metric system, they tend to focus on mass with grams and the other units of, of mass. There is a unit of weight in the metric system called a Newton, but it only really gets used in, in science and engineering applications. If we had to measure something smaller than each of these, we used prefixes. Deci means one-tenth. So a deci liter is one-tenth of a liter. Centi is one one-hundredth. It's like a centimeter, abbreviated CM, is one one-hundredth of a meter. Milli is one one-thousandth. So a milligram, abbreviated MG, is a thousandth of a gram. Now you notice we went every 10 here, one tenth, one hundredth, one thousandth. They skip a couple, they don't do a ten thousandth or a hundred thousandth. They jump to one millionth. One millionth is micro. Now the abbreviation for micro, the official abbreviation for micro is mu. It's like a micro liter would be mu L. It looks like this. That's the Greek letter mu. It looks kind of like a U with a long tail. Now in the medical field, uh, medicine is one of the first fields where everything had to be en data entered into a computer. There is no mu key on a computer. So in the medical field, for microliter, instead of mu L, they use MCL. And microgram would be MCG. So they use MC a lot for micro instead of the mu. Going the other direction, um, deca, if we have bigger items, means 10. Now, deci was already used for, D was already used for deci, so for deca, it was DA, so a decameter is DAM. Hecto was 100, so a hectoliter is 100 liters. Kilo is 1,000, so 1,000 grams or kilogram is a thousand grams and then just like on the other side they didn't do ten thousands or hundred thousands they skipped up to a million and million is mega you'll notice I capitalized the M there because a mega gram is with a capital M instead of a small M 
That would be a million grams. Now a megagram has been renamed. It's called one metric ton. So one me metric ton is a, a million grams or a thousand kilograms. Now our abbreviations with the metric system are very, very simple because each space on this table is either multiplying or dividing by 10. Each space is just moving the decimal point one unit. So if I have 32 centimeters and I want to convert that into meters, all I have to do is look at the chart. From centimeters to meters, I'm going two spots to the left. My decimal point, which is here, goes two spots to the left. So that is 0.32 meters. Now in medicine, as we mentioned before, we always put that zero in front of the decimal point, just for clarity. Um, if I have 0 0.09 liters, and I want to know how many milliliters that is. Liters to milliliters is going three spots to the right. So my decimal point goes one, two, three. Add in those zeros, that's 900 milliliters. So not only are the convert, measurement conversions within the metric system really simple because it's all moving decimal points because everything's powers of 10, the translations from one unit to another are simple. One milliliter was actually defined to be a cube that was one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. So one milliliter is literally one centimeter cube, one cubic centimeter. Whereas you remember in the standard system, one gallon was about 231 gallons, or two, 231 cubic inches. One gram is defined to be the mass of one milliliter of water. So one gram and one milliliter of water, any liquid that's really close to the density of water, you can... Do that equivalence of one gram is about one milliliter. So we can translate from volume into mass very simply as well. So as you can see, the metric system was well planned out and it eliminated a lot of these uh, confusing and, and kind of awkward things in our standard system. Um, we mentioned apothecary units. We'll get to those on Monday. For now, I'll give you guys some homework. In your book, page 103, 1 through 19, the odds. And on page 110, 1 through 41, the odds. Okay, you guys have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday.